Yo, my Lacan videos are popular, at least at least compared to the ones that I've done. Um, but Deleuze and Guattari are done with psychoanalysis. It's over. It's too limiting. It had its day. So brace yourself for some dissonance and you may have to work out for yourself which side you fall on. This is gonna be sweeping and long, so give me those contents and keep hold of your avocado toast. This book, this book is really difficult, though maybe not as difficult as it seems the first time you open it. I'm not gonna summarize the whole thing, I'm just gonna make the case that it offers a model for an alternative politics. It's a left politics, but all left. Oh, that's exactly what we need. One more label for leftists to differentiate themselves from every other leftist on the internet. But no, this is a little different as a model. Still, it's interested in capitalism and a critique of capitalism, but far less interested in ideology. And instead, it focuses on generating resistances. This book, and here, let's try that movie magic. Right there. The title, let's break it down. First, Anti-Oedipus, it's against psychoanalysis and to an extent, ideology critique also. The Oedipus, of course, is Freud's Oedipus complex, which is the foundation of psychoanalysis. Capitalism, which as you know, is the global desiring machine, which captures our desire. And finally, schizophrenia, which is a model for how we could think more creatively and less, what should I say, uh, hierarchically or structurally. Now this goes without saying, but schizophrenia is a psychiatric disorder. It's unpleasant to have, I'm sure. Should the man of only all be silent? Jesus Christ, should he have been silent? But Qatari, the psychoanalyst, and Deleuze, the philosopher, see potential in schizophrenic delirium as a productive political process. It's an unusual hypothesis, but let's give it a shot. So for DNG, schizophrenic delirium is creative in that delusions and hallucinations spring forth into the world. And thought and language are non-linear in the midst of this delirium. Now, of course, we don't want to imitate the content of this process of schizophrenic delusion, just the form or the movement of it in thought. Schizophrenic delirium is something actually kind of special. That is, it's unrepressed, uncoded, freed, desire and desire is the subject of this book one more time desire is the subject of this book this will help a lot if you try to open it and get lost now desire is something that's almost never free and trying to free it is why dolce and gabbana are both anti-psychoanalysis and anti-capitalist together in this same book like delirium, capitalism decodes, but it does so only so that it can trap our desires in new systems of control. Video link up there. Now, the delirium of schizophrenia is freed desire. Thus, it's a limit that not even capitalism can capture, channel, or control. So you and I gotta be more schizo to be politically effective. This is not revolution in the sense of overthrow, but revolution for a community within, pushing out. Here is the problem. Most of the time, desire is repressed by hierarchies and authority structures, or it's being channeled by capitalism. Being repressed and being channeled are, I guess, slightly different, but in both cases, your desire is not free. It's subject to one form of power or the other, either disciplinary or a control system. Conversely, liberated desire means desire that escapes the impasse of private fantasy. It's not a question of adapting it, socializing it, or disciplining it, but of plugging it in in such a way that its process not be interrupted in the social body and that its expression be collective. Now, if you've tried it, this just might be the most difficult book you've ever opened, uh, and that's because of its style. So, here's a little sample. 
We are all schizos. We are all perverts. What neurotic, provided he is somewhat serious, is not leaning against the rock of schizophrenia. A rock, in this case, mobile, aerolytic. Who does not haunt the perverse territorialities beyond the kindergartens of Oedipus? Now, the reason it's so difficult to follow, along with its sequel, A Thousand Plateaus, of course, is that DNG appealed to readers to think deliriously, not linearly, just like it's tough to follow the writing or speech of a schizophrenic during a psychotic episode. I am a seer of spirits. I communicate with souls. You know, I can't eat because I don't have a stomach, or an alien civilization is trying to steal my thoughts. Deleuze and Guattari want to make this a model of political thinking. Hear this out, hear this out. It's good, it's difficult, but it's probably the most innovative post-68 political project I know of. One that's radically opposed to the simple class or identity politics that's the entire menu these days. And not everyone thinks so. Uh-oh. For these guys, Deleuze is either a fake anti-Hegelian or politically impotent or most weirdly a crypto-authoritarian statist. Sorry, no, uh, not getting into that. Bye-bye, boys. Okay, watch this. Go. The politics of capitalist realism. So first, I need to set you up with the problem that's being solved here, hopefully. And the problem with left politics in the 70s don't really seem all that different from the problems with left politics today. So this book holds up. Anyway, the main problem is our political world picture. In this picture, the world is broken up into zones and regimes of authority. If we are picturing an anonymous political subject, it'll be layered something like this. There's a nice picture, body, mind, social, political, and then we'll just call this world-historical. It's that which is outside ideology. We can also call it, I don't know, material conditions, but it includes facts such as ownership and capital, most importantly. Okay, so each concentric sphere here is sort of circumscribed by the one larger than it. Your mind is within ideology, which is inside the world historical, and so on. So I'm picturing this just as a version of a political mindset, one that we kind of have as a default. We have individuals whose vision of the world historical, namely capital, is obscured by ideology. Ideology, of course, makes sure that nothing changes out here. So for a leftist, and especially an online leftist, all politics turns into making a stand in these zones because down here, the mind and the body, these zones have been abandoned to medical professionals, namely psychiatrists and doctors. Leftists, for that reason, don't often make claims to these zones. Except for Deleuze and Guattari, of course. Then outside of ideology, the, the most encompassing sphere is, you know, the world, including facts such as ownership, uh, the truth about labor and material conditions, and you could just say history. This regime is known to economists, uh, historians, and other scientific specialists. And this, of course, is the region that everyone hopes to change, hopes they can change, but it feels impossible. So what happens instead as a consequence is all these territories are marked out and argued about on the internet. So this diagram, for me, explains to leftists why not everyone is a leftist. You can't change material conditions because ideology is in the way. And you know, too many simp dads are watching propaganda on TV, and that's why we can't have nice things, or the things that we want. Uh, access to health stuff, education, wealth redistribution. But all politics, for the most part, is limited to this region. So what you're doing when arguing about politics is just arguing over zone control and setting up these little camps in here. Campground politics. And of course, the world historical is never affected by discussions or debates like these. And yet, so much of our time is spent in these zones with all manner of activists, 
pundits, experts, theorists, YouTube channels. Yeah, I'm in here too. Here to explain why not everyone agrees with us. But hey, here is the picture of capitalist realism, at least my picture. So everyone has their zone and everyone stays in their zone. Medical professionals down here, culture warriors here, the cancelers and caller outers here, and then the clubs of, you know, anarcho, communo, accelerationo, crypto, primitivo, Lenin, Mao, whateverists and not a single one of these labels makes any difference, by the way, then the real world keeps on trucking. You know, where capital actually flows and where wealth begets wealth. But every cause camper and LARPer gets to go to bed thinking that they've had a good moral day because they posted about what they believe the world should look like on the internet. If this looks like a problem to you, uh, then maybe Deleuze and Guattari have a project for you. You may find this interesting. Give me that ding. Delirium. So here's our campground. Everyone's in their zone doing whatever they're doing. Now here's what happens in schizophrenic thought, which doesn't stay inside the lines at all. It's crossing boundaries because that's its defining feature. Should the man of only all be silent? Jesus Christ, should he have been silent? Now, the schizophrenic claims authority over world history, declaring himself to be Napoleon or Jesus, then takes it back and writes it on his body, not even on the outside, but inside. The doctor has stolen his stomach. There is no boundary between the inside and the outside. The e NSA is eavesdropping on his thoughts. His thoughts are outside of his head. Someone has planted chips under his skin. Can you see what's going on here? The schizo does not limit themselves to territories. Schizo thought takes over every territory and you can't keep up with it. To get ahead of capitalist realism, this is what we should be going for. A process and not a goal, a production and not an expression. Here we can also see why Delari object to psychoanalysis. All of your motivations and behaviors are interpreted here opposed to the father, displacing the desire of the mother. This is another apparatus for limiting desire, not freeing it. And note, Guattari was a student of Lacan before this, and he quit the team. While most of their derision is directed at Freudian analysts, they do claim that Lacan changing the mommy-daddy triangle to one of algebra, you know, law, object, ah, desire, it's really just kicking the can further down the road without explaining anything more about desire, qua production. They hate this idea that desire is a lack, and that's why psychoanalysis is old news, and we now need to go to schizoanalysis. All right, I'm hoping you'd like to know what this book actually says, uh, and then I'll give you some examples. Here's the movement of schizo desire. The code of delirium or of desire proves to have an extraordinary fluidity. It might be said that the schizophrenic passes from one code to the other, but he deliberately scrambles all the codes by quickly shifting from one to another according to the questions asked him, never giving the same explanation from one day to the next, never invoking the same in genealogy, never recording the same event in the same way. So this freed, fluid desire resists capitalism, which wants you in a demographic, so that it can create needs for you or desires. The schizo is too slippery for all that. Let me give you an example. Judge Schraber. Schraber wrote a now famous book from a mental asylum in 1900. Everyone, including Freud, uses it as the paradigmatic paranoiac schizoid. The psychiatric system is obviously repressive. It restrains desire, either physically or psychochemically. But from here, Judge Schraber creates this complicated mythical universe full of magical rays and miracles, upper gods, lower gods, voices of nerve language and struggles against the order of the world. It's bizarre, paranoid, because Schraber is schizo, but he's definitely not staying in his zone. 
He goes all the way up to God, into history, then back into his own body, claiming authority. I am God. I was not God. I am a clown of God. Now, the God of Schreber's world is punitive and demanding. So Freud reads this and in Freudian fashion goes, oh, this whole thing must be a repressed resentment against the father. Deleuze and Guattari are like, no, stop making everything about the family and instead listen to what he says. Look at what he says. His language doesn't need to re represent something else. What it does do is create these connections. So D and G have this concept called the body without organs. I've explained this elsewhere, but look at what Schreber writes in this book. I could not eat because I had no stomach. Sometimes immediately before meals, a stomach was, so to speak, produced ad hoc by miracles. So he can't eat because he has no stomach, but sometimes he would get a miraculous stomach just there on the spot temporarily so that he was able to eat again. This is a diagnosis that a non-schizo wouldn't make. We find it humorous. Most non-schizos are fine subjecting themselves to a doctor's professional diagnosis, but not Schreber. And by the way, we're not done with Schreber's stomach because now he thinks there's something wrong with the miraculous stomach he just got. The Viennese nerve specialist miraculously produced in place of my healthy natural stomach, a very inferior so-called Jew's stomach. Naturally, this never lasted long. The stomach which had been produced by miracles in any case, only an inferior stomach was usually removed again miraculously. Stomach appears, stomach disappears. His doctor miraculously puts in an inferior Jewish stomach into his body and then miraculously takes it out again. Bing, bing. So aside from being a pretty humorous delusion here, we can also note that racism is part of Schreber's delirium. Obviously, we don't like the racism, but then again, look to the form of the thought instead of the content and ask the question then, what is a race? So races make up the world historical. They're way out here in our diagram. Part of human history that extends past us as individuals in both directions. So Deleuze and Guattari note that the schizo moves through the whole world and all of history fluidly, marking out his own body as a territory of history. So yeah, what Schreber said is racist, but the point is that all these disparate regions can be intimately and creatively connected. The inside of the body connects directly with world history in this case. So in their interpretation, here are their words. First things to be distributed on the body with their organs are races, cultures, and their gods. The fact has often been overlooked that the schizo indeed participates in history. He hallucinates and raves universal history and proliferates the races. All delirium is racial, which does not necessarily mean racist. So Deleuze and Guattari's problem with psychoanalysis is that it claims to be listening to the words of its patients, the analyzants. But really, what they do is ignore everything except what can relate to family dynamics. Thus, God equals father. But this misses all the creative boundary crossing that's happening right in front of their face in this Schreber case. That's right. Oedipus is completely useless as the schizophrenic has escaped the mommy-daddy triangle. I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that. That's their words, not mine. So here's another example. A common delusion for schizophrenics is that someone's listening in on their thoughts. And that's crossing another boundary, the social and the mind. Sometimes they believe themselves to be messianic figures or the opposite gender temporarily. Sometimes their organs belong to a different race or they disappear entirely. See, all of this is inside the body, outside the body, in world history, in the social, in the mind. And there's utility here, and that's which there's no identity to which this creativity is affixed because it's always moving. Deleuze and Guattari would be adamantly imposed to identity politics for this reason. To commit to an identity is to have your desire captured and encircled by the state or by capitalism 
And as a minority then, you have accepted the state's definition of you and become a statistic or a demographic. That is, you become molar. Becoming minor means you always elude the state. And to become minor, you need to follow the schizo. Okay, what does this boundary crossing look like? Well, this depends on what you're doing. They tried it as writers. And you can see the result here. This is the table of contents from A Thousand Plateaus, which creates an assemblage of concepts from literature, psychoanalysis, history, science, art, etc. that are happy intentionally going all over the place. And Guattari explains why. The psychoanalysts have their own cooking utensils, and the politicians have their own, etc. The necessity to re-examine this division is not born from some concern for eclectism, and it does not necessarily lead to some sort of confusion, the same way that it is not due to confusion that a schizophrenic jumps from one register to the next. So you can see the intention here. It is the reality he finds himself confronted with that drives him to do it. Well, from this perspective, people in the human sciences and in politics should, in a sense, go a little schizo, to have the same ability to embrace all the disciplines together. That is, of course, to not get stuck in camps. The creative subject imitates the desire of schizophrenic delirium. Boundaries and disciplines are nothing to it. They are collapsed. It has no inside, no organs. It's an intensity purely on the plane of imminence, and that's the nomad, in contrast to the state specialist, another new character in Dillas and Guattari's philosophy. I'm not gonna tell you what to do, and I never tell anyone what to do, but this is an interesting way to reconsider the social field. So, here it is, it's an offering. These days, um, and I spend an unfortunate amount of time on the internet, so I know this, but these days, people are all trying to make themselves specialists within boundaries of their field. I speak as a socialist, and I speak for the socialist community, so to, you know, so to speak. I speak as an anarchist. I speak for the gay community. I speak for the black community. As a blank, here's what we say. Now, as soon as you speak as an identity, you have stopped becoming that identity. And the risk is, then you're stuck. Then your community becomes a demographic for capital interests, including politics, as a voting bloc. Revolutionaries and nomads do not speak to the state. They seek to subvert it creatively. As you can guess, here's where capitalism and schizoanalysis come in as sort of opposing forces. Politics as this, I speak as a blank to the state, is actually useless and it's made useless by capitalism. Capitalism is a channeling machine and it has no opinion of you or your identity. In fact, it decodes your identity and whichever community you identify with. Capital growth goes wherever it wants, over borders, into computers, creating value here and destroying it elsewhere. Capitalism is a flow that decodes what we would call tradition, mores, and identities. This is exciting in a way because it does the same thing as a schizophrenic thought, which also ignores boundaries, and it <laughs> goes where it wants. But capitalism has one limitation from which it can never escape, the profit motive. Once it identifies you, it's gonna try to channel your desire, usually as a demographic representative, as an identity. It will create needs for you. Here's what you want, here's how to look, here's your five-year plan, here's what's wrong with you, and here are your meds. Capital captures for profit. Now this can be a bit overwhelming, but it also demonstrates that there's a limit to capitalism. And that's our advantage in resistance, to become other than ourselves. So, becoming schizo, becoming minor, becoming nomadic. This is the mode of escape, whether it's as an artist, writer, musician, or most importantly, as a political subject. This has, by the way, both revolutionary and fascist potential. Nazism, for example, crosses and folds the social field by drawing on mythological histories, race science, and divine destinies in the theories of 
um, Rosenberg, Alfred Rosenberg, for example. But there's also a revolutionary potential in a schizoanalytic. Virtual Desiring Machines. There are tons of examples in Delari's schizoanalysis, both in Anti Oedipus and Thousand Plateaus, but they were written in the 70s, so I think they're not gonna have the same resonance with us, probably. So that's why I've tried, I'm gonna offer you here a different example for you, one that emerges adjacent to the beating heart of capitalism in New York City. Final section. To be honest, I'm surprised you're still here. Thanks. I hope you're having fun. I'm getting a little sweaty. Now, the Native Tongues Collective is a small movement from the late 80s and early 90s, but it follows the schizo line of deterritorialization, uniting history, both real and mythical, art, music, and style in a movement of identity creation. It also, I think, serves as a productive model for political resistance. It was all part of a searching for our identity as people of color, as black and Latino people. Well, who are we really, you know? Because it wasn't enough for us to just have our own culture then at time called hip hop. We were like, wait a minute, why don't we embrace where we came from? Like, this is great, because it, it actually hits so many of the right notes in terms of applying theory, becoming minor, deterritorialization, and artistic innovation past the edge of capitalism. At least it was past the edge, probably not anymore, but it takes a lot of effort, continued effort to stay past the edge of capitalism, which again seeks to capture the new desire and anything that you've created, really. Anyway, back to this. This little energy explosion includes all the potentiality in creating yourself as subject. In this case, it's becoming minor. First of all, uh, here are the native tongues. So obviously they're a visible minority relative to white America and a creative minority relative to the profitability of hip hop in the late 80s compared to like gangsta rap, for example. Now for Deleuze and Guattari, minorities can deterritorialize a major culture because no matter how inside a culture a minority is, they can always see it as if from outside. Their main example is Kafka's literature, who was Jewish and wrote in Prague German as opposed to High German. But you get this outside perspective from within as a minority. So the Native Tongues Collective deterritorializes by consciously breaking from uh, the existing symbols of captured or commercialized hip hop. Hip hop was growing in popularity and this collective, including the groups uh, De La Soul and A Tribe Called Quest, are known for this lyrical style called conscious rap. And the implication, I guess, is that other rap is unconscious, and that would be a fun little rabbit trail to go down, but anyway. Um, they immediately distance themselves, qua image, from the bling gun thug image of the emerging gangster rap. We started giving rappers Zulu beads and African medallions. We was like shaming people that still wore jewelry. You know what I mean? And we, we would get on them and get on them and get on them. And we put so much pressure on rappers themselves mm. that even LL Cool J and Run DMC took their jury off. In this video, De La Soul does it explicitly. This is called uh, Me, Myself and I by De La Soul. Rejecting one hip hop uniform, they re territorialize themselves with African regalia, spinning off the aesthetic of the universal Zulu nation. In Deleuzean terms, becoming African American and folding identity and world history together to create a divergent and new line of flight. It's schizophrenic in the same way that Schreiber thought about the race of his stomach, except now we are applying it to an image. 
Now, Dillas and Guitari give the, uh, I guess, prereqs or what to look for when something's being deterritorialized in a minor literature. And all three of these things apply here. So, the three characteristics of a minor literature are the deterritorialization of language, in this case, through rap music, obviously, the connection of the individual to a political immediacy, and the collective assemblage of enunciation. We might as well say that Minor no longer designates specific literatures, but the revolutionary conditions for every literature within the heart of the established literature. By the way, it's from a different book, the Kafka book. So minorities really don't have the privilege of not being political. A minority stance vis-a-vis -vis the state is ipso facto political, and the native tongues embrace this, pushing outward in every direction at once. Here's another line, or novel, line of flight. Hip hop tends to be hyper masculine and violent, even. And the native tongues included anthems like Queen Latifah's Ladies First and Unity, which used a masculine or masculine dominated medium to vocalize issues like domestic violence or speak towards the empowerment of women. De territorialized. I wish I could show you mo more examples, but I don't want to get murdered on the copyright, so please look up these examples. This is all political, and it never sticks to a zone. This collective was very involved in community organization and against drugs and violence, which is elsewhere valorized in hip hop. Now this in itself is not that different from a lot of political organization, but what makes this special is that the whole orbit of identity formation and political activity circles art, hip hop, invention, lyrics. Now I don't know anything about uh, music theory or history other than to say, you know, I like the lyrics and I like how this sounds and I like the samples, but all the sources that I looked at for this speak to the innovation of uh, the sampling and recording used especially by the groups De La Soul and uh, Tribe Called Quest. For example, sampling jazz music. And the main Deleuzean point here is that all of this comes together. The art, the style, the image, the identity formation. So the Deleuzean descriptor for all of this is an intensity. An intensity that sort of burst out into all this stuff. Identity, image, art, and politics all at the same time. So this is not a purity politics, not a politics of scolding people, not a politics of stepping on Twitter rivals. It's a politics entirely of creation, inventing styles, identities, and coloring outside of lines. A politics of creativity. This becoming minor isn't overly concerned with answering the major, because instead it just transcends the channels it creates for desire. No doubt, and of course this always happens, it was eventually commercialized, now it's cheap, but the ongoing goal of deterritorialization here is to always stay ahead, to keep your desire out in front. Commercialization is always rearguard because capitalism is not free desire, and that's always the schizo subject's advantage. So this is not another manifesto. God knows there are enough of those. But Deleuze and Guattari in these books are trying to unite form and content. For them, philosophy has gotten boring, stale, cut off, and put into boxes and academic departments. We could say the same thing about our political positions, always focused on the cause of the hour and who broke the rules. When there's a world's wealth out there of connections, styles, histories, mythologies even, to be created or recreated. If we were doing politics like this, there wouldn't be a purity test at the door and factions would have no use. Anyway, that's my appeal. And to a lesser degree, this philosophy reflects what I kind of hope that this channel does, namely to be informative, not boring, uh, creative when I can be, and adverse to the prevailing winds of online media. So you can thank my patrons who picked this topic for the rest of y'all. They're keeping this going, so uh, thank you. Deep thanks to them. Supporting my work there is not just a one-way exchange either. Uh, patrons get a whole bunch of more in-depth content on the stuff that I deal with here. So if that's a draw for you, check it out. Now we gotta do this 
call to action. So giving a call to action with Deleuze and Guattari is always tough because everyone wants to know, you know, what can I do? Um, and they walked their walk by doing what they were trained in, that is writing books. Um, I'm trying it with YouTube and not very well, actually. This is definitely not a schizophrenic episode. It's extremely linear, uh, like this. But I have to walk before I run, okay? So uh, Native Tongues did it, of course, with music. So to you, if you're a writer, activist, cartoonist, academic, musician, or a memer, the call to action here is just to go schizo. And what does that mean? Cross a boundary, make a new connection, try something, experiment, stay ahead of the curve, go schizo. All right, this is Plastic Pills, go schizo.